you all for joining us today. We're so excited to have this event and we really appreciate all the work that the Vasculitis Foundation did to sponsor this and bring everyone together. So welcome. Um, I'm Zach Wallace. I'm one of the rheumatologists. I uh, co-direct our on the rheumatology side, um, our vasculitis program with Sebastian Unizoni, who will be speaking uh, right after me. So um, as I said, I just wanna thank and acknowledge the Vasculitis Foundation who did so much work to help put this together with us. Um, Joyce and Mary um, were incredible uh, partners in, in planning all this. And then on the rheumatology side, I wanna thank Ana Fernandez who couldn't be here today. She's one of our project managers in the research side. She helped organize all this with um, David and Zach who are floating around. Um, and then also just wanna acknowledge the folks from Mass General Brigham who helped us set all this up and are here uh, supporting us. So for vascular care at the MGH, we're so lucky to have two amazing places where you get your care. So on the rheumatology side, uh, there's a few of us listed here. So myself and Sebastian, um, Dr. Milosovsky, Matza, Patel, Perugino, and John Stone. Um, and so we're so happy to have been able to partner with the Vasculitis Foundation with our nephrology colleagues to um, host you all today. Um, and on the nephrology side in the Vasculitis and Glomerulonephritis Center, um, there's uh, Dr. Niles and Dr. Zanozzi and jo Dr. Giavelin. And Dr. Zanozzi will be um, speaking with us uh, later this morning. Uh, there'll also be a round table uh, time later this morning. We'll be able to ask questions and uh, hopefully connect with some of the clinicians who are here. I also just want to acknowledge all of our collaborators who help us take care of, of patients at Mass General um, and across the system. Folks from dermatology are here today, ENT, neurology, ophthalmology, neuroophthalmology, pulmonary, everyone is just um, surgery. Everyone's so uh, important in the care of patients with these conditions. And so we're so happy to have their collaboration and support um, and making sure that we get the best outcomes for our patients. So uh, just a brief overview of the speakers this morning. So um, Sebastian Inuzoni is going to be talking about giant cell arteritis and current treatments and future directions. Dr. Miloslavsky is going to be talking about steroid toxicity, what it is, how it's measured, and what can be done to prevent it. Dr. Cotton is joining us to talk about how to manage COVID-19 risk when immunosuppressed. Dr. Daniel Hall is going to be talking to us about how to approach sleep, pain, fatigue, and managing uncertainty when living with chronic conditions. Dr. Zanozzi is going to be talking to us about preventing progressive chronic kidney disease um, in patients who are living with vasculitis. And then we have two amazing colleagues from the Vasculitis Foundation patients who are going to be speaking with us. Dr. Gordon is going to be talking about um, the Vasculitis Patient Powered Research Network. Uh, and Stacy uh, is going to be talking about victory, uh, sorry, about um, drawing a blank now, but Stacey's gonna be talking to us as well. And we're lucky to have her um, for, from victory over vasculitis. So very excited about our future together. Um, we're so happy you're here today. Hopefully this is the first of many conferences like this moving forward um, so that we can work together and partner with patients to advance clinical care, discover new treatments, um, educate and recruit the next generation of clinicians and researchers in this space and advocate for patients um, to increase access to care and treatment. Um, a few housekeeping measures. So first, bathrooms are, if you go out the back, take a left and another left by the security desk, you'll see in the far corner, their bathrooms are located there. Want to thank our sponsors who are here today and Amgen for their support as well for this meeting. Um, please keep your cell phones on silent during the meeting so there aren't interruptions. Um, there are tables in the back corner where you can um, learn more uh, from the Vasculitis Foundation and from some of the vasculitis research that we're doing. On the table, there are QR codes. You can take a photo, use your cam camera on your phone to um, screenshot that and use that to get to a link. And from there, you can let us know if you'd like to learn more about research or clinical care or anything else um, at Mass General related to vasculitis. Um, and then please keep your masks on unless you're eating or drinking. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to move right into our first program. So Dr. Unizoni is, as I said, the co-director of the rheumatology side of uh, vasculitis care here. He's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He received his MD from Universidad Nacional de la Plata in Buenos Aires 
And he finished a fellowship in clinical immunology there and then moved here. He completed a medical residency at St. Luke's in New York and his rheumatology fellowship here at MGH. And we've been so lucky that he's been here ever since. He conducts uh, clinical and translational research in vasculitis, uh, particularly giant cell arteritis. So thanks very much, Sebastian. Thank you, Zach. Uh, welcome, everyone. Very happy that you're all here. Um, we'll talk about GCA. Um, this is the alternative title, Battling the Giant. And they are trying to bring down a gigantic cactus in the north of Argentina. So you'll see a few pictures through landscape uh, from Argentina through, throughout the talk. So the objective is really to bring good news. So a lot of progress has, has happened in GCA in the last several years. And, and the idea is to comment on, on, on that in terms of diagnosis, in terms of treatment, and most importantly, in terms of um, what's coming. Uh, disclosures, I will be mentioning a bunch of medications that are not really approved yet. Some of them we, will be, hopefully for the treatment of GCA, so you're aware. Uh, this is very brief. Some of you know what this is. It's an inflammatory disease of the large arteries. We divide vasculitis depending on the size of the arteries that get inflammation. So GCA is not only the most frequent large vessel vasculitis, but it's the most frequent vasculitis in adults. Um, the targets tend to be the aorta, the main branches of the aorta with predilection of the head and neck, not the intracranial arteries, but the, the arteries outside, the scalp, for example, the temporal arteries. That's why an alternative name is temporal arteritis. Um, again, the most frequent um, vasculitis in adults, usually patients are older than 50, most likely they will be 60, 70, 75. It's a disease of um, the white population more than other races, although you can see it in blacks and, and Hispanic patients, Asian patients too. And, um, and it's more frequent in women than men, two to one, more or less. Uh, people present usually with three or four different sets of clinical manifestations, what we call cranial. It's usually headaches or pain when they chew. Sometimes they can have scalp tenderness when they are combing their hair or if they are using a hat or if they are resting on a pillow, they may feel discomfort in the scalp. Um, some patients will have visual symptoms, blurry vision or double vision. Rarely they can lose vision. If that happens, it's an early event. Once the patient is diagnosed and is receiving treatment, that is, ex that is extremely rare. It's not impossible, but it's very, very rare. 50% uh, of the patients, more or less, also will have pain and stiffness of the shoulders and hips, usually after being in mobile, after sleeping or after a long drive, for example. After 60 minutes, 30 minutes of moving around, the pain, the stiffness will get better. That's what we call inflammatory pain and stiffness, something that appears after rest and gets better with motion, with activities. Most of the patients will be tired or may have decreased appetite, even may have weight loss. And then most of the patients, over 95% more or less, when we check blood, we, we measure these inflammatory markers, the set rate that is I'm sure that you are all very familiar with, or the CRP, and in most cases, those are elevated. The problem is that those markers are not specific for the disease. Many, many different things can make them go up. So it's, it's very useful to, to, to understand that there's inflammation going on, but not enough to, to give it a name. So the first good news is that nowadays we have guidelines pretty much everywhere. So since 2018, we have guidelines in Europe, Recently, uh, the ACR and the Vasculitis Foundation partnered to publish the American guidelines. And very, very recently, we also published Latin American guidelines. So there's a lot of education going around. So clinicians or other providers that are not familiar with these conditions, hopefully will become familiar by reading these guidelines. We have made a lot of progress in terms of diagnosing the disease, historically, the biopsy of a temporal artery was the only test available for many decades. And for several years now we're using ultrasounds. So in a patient that is the right demographics and the right clinical manifestation, headaches, PMR, when one does a temporal artery ultrasound and find this thickening around the artery, that is seen here, right, this black, halo around the artery, that's enough to 
diagnose the patients with GCA without needing to, to, to cut the patient, right? It's a non-invasive test. And more recently, several other modalities, not only to image the cranial arteries, but also the large arteries like MRI, CT, or, or PET. So now we have a toolbox. It's not a matter of what test is better. So whatever is available, whatever the, the, the clinician or the rheumatologist has experience with uh, is useful. There's a toolbox full of tools and we can use them depending on where we are. Uh, these are examples of what we look for when we're doing a CT, for example, a CAT scan of the arteries. Uh, this is a little bit technical, but this looks normal. There's no sickening of the, this is the aorta, right? The wall is very, very thin, one or two millimeters. But here we see that the wall is, I don't know, four, five, six millimeters. So thickening of the arterial walls. We can see that with also CT. Here we see that this wall should be thinner. So here is thickened. And then we also look not only at the walls of the arteries, but the lumens. And when there's inflammation, the lumens tend to shrink or narrow. We call that stenosis. So here we can see these are the arteries called subclavians, the ones that go and become the brachial arteries, the arteries of the arms. And here we can see that the lumen slowly disappears, fades away. That diffuse stenosis is characteristic of vasculitis. And finally, a PET CT. Usually it is the combination of a CAT scan plus a PET. Uh, here we have the PET, here we have the CAT scan, and here is the merge of those two. And this orange is, is, a, is a tracer that we inject and is captured by these cells that are active because there are inflammatory cells that are in the wall of the arteries. And then we can see how it highlights the wall of the arteries. So a lot of progress from biopsy to ultrasound to many different types of imaging, not only for the cranial arteries, but for the larger arteries of, of the chest and abdomen. Um, the next is to talk a little bit of what we do right now, what's the standard of care now. And then at the end, we'll touch base on the future perspectives. So this is the past. This is, many of you are familiar with this, up to, I would say, 2010, 2015 really the only medication that was in use was prednisone. Patients usually required more than one year, oftentimes two, three, four years of prednisone. Mm, a common story is to, to have to adjust the dose several times because the symptoms reappear when the dose of prednisone goes below 10 milligrams or seven milligrams. Um, and then another common story is the, the lack of biomarkers to really assess when a patient is active or in remission. So the story of prednisone hopefully is becoming, we still need prednisone, but we need less prednisone. If we use prednisone alone, 60%, 70% of the patients will have a relapse and more than 80%, 90% will have side effects from prednisone. So there's been a lot of research to find alternatives hopefully in the future to replace steroids completely. For now, to shrink this taper from one year, two years to six months or even less. Um, over the years, many medications have been tried without success. Metrotrexate is one that has had some success, maybe in one out of five, one out of six patients. Metrotrexate can keep the disease in remission and spare some use of um, prednisone but it's not highly effective, but it's an option. Um, it's widely used in, 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 for example, Latin America where expensive medications are, are difficult to, are restricted or difficult to, to, to get approval for. So the game changed really in 2017 when this trial was published. After a small trial in Switzerland, there was a big phase three international multicenter trial called JAYACTA. In summary, you may know already about this, patients receive either prednisone alone versus prednisone plus tocilizumab, and the patients on tocilizumab plus prednisone did much better. More than 50% of them were able to stay in remission for one year, were able to discontinue prednisone versus less than 20% of the ones that received prednisone alone. Those had relapses and need to use, needed to use more prednisone. At the end of the study, 
the cumulative prednisone dose, this exposure to prednisone was significantly less in patients receiving tocilizumab than patients receiving a placebo. Uh, is it a cure? No, it's not. 20%, 30% may still relapse on tocilizumab, but that's better than the 65, 70% of patients relapsing if you take prednisone alone. So not only remission and, and, and sparing of prednisone, but quality of life. So now it's very common in clinical trials, uh, in, thankfully, to include other outcomes, including quality of life. So this is just an example. Uh, what I'll show you is the comparison between the patients that receive prednisone only for six months versus the ones that receive prednisone plus tocilizumab. In green, you see the patients on prednisone alone at baseline. Uh, those are measures of quality of life, fatigue, uh, functioning, and, and, and several measures of quality of life. So at baseline, both groups, the green, prednisone alone, and the red, prednisone plus tocilizumab, are very similar. This is at baseline. Nobody has studied treatment. In gray, you see normal persons without GCA, so they perform much better. After one year of treatment, patients receiving only prednisone feel better. Right, you see the dark green compared to the light green. But the patients receiving tocilizumab do every, even better than that. Uh, so not only remission and, and prednisone sparing, but also quality of life, which is great. So the standard of care nowadays, I would say across the, 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 the globe is to use prednisone still because it protects the eyes and then use tocilizumab for new onset patients and also for relapsing patients. That's what the ACR and Vascularitis Foundation recommends. That's what we recommend in PANLAR. And the European guidelines are a little bit more restricted, but tocilizumab is still recommending for patients with relapse or patients with new onset disease who might be at risk of prednisone toxicity, which is pretty much all of the patients or most of the patients. <laughs> so now we will move to the future directions. This is the Aconcagua a mountain is in Mendoza, the, the wine region of Argentina. And before I show you a picture of the falls in, in Iguazu, the border with Brazil and, and Uruguay. <clears throat> so the first question for the future is, can we do less than six months of prednisone? And the answer is maybe. We, we cannot recommend this widely yet because it hasn't been tested in, in, in large clinical trials, but there's a hint that it might be possible. This is a very provocative study from Switzerland where Patients only received three intravenous doses of steroids, no more, and then tocilizumab, and they were followed for one year. So the, the take uh, message is that 70% of those patients were able to enter remission and stay in remission for one year. The study was designed in a way that the primary outcome wasn't met because it was very, very stringent, but the secondary outcome or endpoint of being in remission for one year was met by 70% of the patients. The caveat is one patient got visual loss. So we need, to, we need to be careful. Is it three doses enough? Maybe not. Uh, but it gives us an idea that less than six months of prison might be possible. In MGH, we did another study a little bit more conservative. We said, okay, let's use only two months of prednisone plus one year of tocilizumab. We tested that in 30 patients and we had very good results. 75% of the patients met this primary endpoint, staying in remission of prednisone at the end of the first year. So what we need now is to do, as I said before, a larger study comparing these two months probably with six months and then be able to finally conclude that we, we can do less. <clears throat> One question that we have often in the clinic with patients is, okay, I've, I've been doing fine. It's been a year on, on Actenra. I don't use any prednisone. When do we stop this medication? The answer is we don't know yet. Um, but we have some data from, from research that can help us take that decision. For now, it's a case by case. We sit down and, and based on the patient uh, preference and the doctor opinion, we kind of merge that and we decide together. But we know that from this landmark trial, the JIACTA trial, those group of patients receiving the, the injection weekly, right, the higher dose, getting to the end of the first year in remission, stopping treatment, well, 40% were able to stay in remission without treatment for two more years, but 60% had a relapse within six months, within 12 months. 
that's some of the information that is available. Other information comes from real world studies. This is our cohort of patients in MGH. Most of them receiving the drug not for one year, but for two, stopping the medication because they feel good or they had a side effect that forced us to stop the medication. So in that case, 30% of those patients had a relapse within one year and close to 50% had a relapse within a year and a half. So it seems that, and it's not surprising that because we are talking about a chronic inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis or any of the other autoimmune diseases, maybe patients need to be on a maintenance suppressive treatment for longer rather than just one year. But again, more work needs to be done. So we are planning hopefully in the near future to, to do a study, to continue gathering information, to, to help answering how to stop, when to stop. What we plan to do is to get a big group of patients that are doing well in remission without steroids on tocilizumab, and then split the group in two. Some patients will decrease the dose and stay for one year at this lower maintenance dose, and half of the group will go without uh, treatment, but with close uh, monitoring. And we're gonna gather a lot of clinical information and then mechanistic studies. We're gonna be sampling this, this group of patients frequently to, to try to understand why patients flare in flare and, and other things about the disease. Um, and then I guess I shouldn't say having GCA is, is, is good news, right? It's always bad news, but having it right now is much better than having the disease a few years ago. With the success of this tocilizumab trial, there's a lot of uh, new trials happening, ongoing. Some with, with results and some still ongoing. This is a cartoon of the inflammation. You don't need to really pay much attention, but there's several cells that are important. Those cells are making different molecules that are important. And there's medications available to block these pathways at different levels. Uh, this is a medication called Abatacept or Orencia. There's a, there has been a small study in which patients receive induction with the drug and steroids, and then when they were doing okay, half of the patients stopped this abatacept and half of the patients continued, and there, there were some preliminary good results. 50% uh, of the patients on the abatacept did fine for one year versus um, only 30% of the patients not receiving abatacept. There's, on, there's an ongoing study, a larger study, to try to confirm this. Um, this is a recent study that we completed with a medication called Mabrilimumab. Again, patients receiving Mabrilimumab plus prednisone versus prednisone alone, and showing that after six months, 80% of the patients on this Mabrilimumab are in remission versus only 50% of the patients on prednisone alone. Uh, another recent study with a medication called Secukinumab or Cosentix. Again, patients on the drug plus prednisone versus prednisone alone. At six months, 70% are doing okay versus 20%. And that response continues to, to, to one year in which 59%, 60% of the patients on this drug are in remission doing fine versus only less than 10% if you were taking only prednisone. Uh, there's a phase three right now to try to expand and confirm we are a site. Um, there's an important study, hopefully publishing results soon with a medication called upadacitinib or Rimboc. that is a pill. It's already in use for rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions, and hopefully will be useful for GCA. There's another study with a molecule called Buselcumab or Tremphia. We are also a site. Um, and finally, there's a comparison between tocilizumab and metotrexate that is being done in France. So that's all. Uh, we have, I think, a few minutes for questions. Um, so thank you very much. I think we have microphones. You just stand up and you can introduce yourself if you want and ask a question. We'll have also breaks and we can talk during the breaks and there's gonna be round, round tables for discussion at the end. Dr. Jassar. 
Good morning. Um, thank you. I'm Arminder Jester, one of the cardiac surgeons at National Hospital. I take care of several of these patients with our vasculitis group. So my question to you, uh, Sebastian, is that the patients that I'm seeing are generally patients that have a, a pathology that requires an intervention or an operation. Um, and we often treat these patients together where they're sometimes being treated with either steroids or tocilizumab before the operation. Could you tell us a little bit about what to expect during that period of time? Um, how long the medication lasts? How long does it need to be stopped? How do we plan their operation in the setting of somebody who has active urotitis? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. There's two pieces of data to mention. 20% uh, more or less of patients with GCA in the long term after five, six, seven years may develop an aneurysm. It's a minority, but we need to kind of monitor patients. And sometimes that aneurysm will stay small forever and won't cause problems but really will grow slowly uh, and will be bigger than 5.5 or 5 centimeters. And then we'll need to be fixed by Dr. Jazar or, or other surgeon uh, to, 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 pre to prevent a, a bad outcome. Uh, and then the other thing is that there's an entity called isolated aortitis that is very similar to GCA. The patients look exactly the same. The only difference is that they don't have the headaches or the PMR. But when, when you see the inflammation in the aorta, it's exactly the same. And, and the same, those patients develop aneurysms and then if they are too big, they're risky. So, so we are more aware now of these things. So we are better at, at monitoring. Many of these patients go on a yearly CAT scan or MR, sometimes even more often. And, and, um, and we used to get to know after surgery, right? But a surgeon would call us, hey, we just did this operation and now the, the lab is telling us that there's inflammation. Uh, and then we, we had to decide, okay, what do we do now? We, do we treat, we don't treat, how, 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 how long do we follow them? But now we are more aware and, and, and we see patients before surgery and we suspect inflammation before surgery. So that's why we are treating more often uh, this inflammation. Still, we don't know who really needs treatment for how long and with what, but we suspect that eradicating inflammation can have an impact not only in, 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 in before surgery, the, the outcome of the surgery, less complications of the surgery, but also in the long term. Uh, so what we do every time we can uh, is to cool it down with prednisone, right? At least a month if we have the time. Sometimes surgery needs to be done tomorrow or today, and we don't have that opportunity. But if we do, at least a month of prednisone most of the time, uh, and a rapid taper, right? Is because also we want the surgeons to be able to operate without too much prednisone that can impair the healing. And then using the, 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 the knowledge we got from GCA, we're using Actemra more often. Again, hasn't been proven. It's just based on indirect evidence. And, and, and the answer is, is difficult, uh, Dr. Jazar, because we don't have a study that tell us we need to do this for one year. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're doing a short prednisone taper, allowing the surgeon to operate within a month or two, if that's possible. And then we keep this Actemra for at least one year. And then the follow-up is with yearly imaging. Uh, but we are in great need of more research, high quality research to really make recommendation better, I guess. That's what I wanted to say. Hello, I'm patient. Um, Suzanne is my name. Um, I was wondering, you showed the cascade of inflammation and said, don't worry about it. But that's what brought us here. Um, I just wonder, are you considering using a cocktail of two or more agents together? Like um, Actemra plus something else? <clears throat> so we always think, we're always thinking about combining things because we know that the body and, and the biology is built in a way that there's redundancy and there's different pathways. And when you block one, another one can overcome uh, the blockade. The problem is that we need to be very careful what to combine because of side effects, right? We, we need a healthy immune system also to fight infection. 
So you don't want to, to, to then cause uh, increased risk of severe infections. The, the, the community of rheumatology, and we have the same thought for all, I would say lupus and, and rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. So far, we tend not to combine biologics, but there's emerging data that in, in some situation it could potentially be done, but we are not there yet. We are more used to combining a biologic, right? This tocilizumab or Cosentix or all these drugs that I show you with the more traditional immunosuppressants that the metrotrexate and the leflunomide are usually pills that we feel more comfortable combining. But again, there's a common theme in vasculitis, specifically in GCA. We need more research before we can go out and say, this is the combination to, to use. But yes, uh, we are always thinking what we could combine to really efficiently bring down all these different branches of, of, of the inflammatory cascade. Let everyone know the blue flash cards are for questions if you want to write them down and hand them in. Go ahead. Yeah. Two-parter. Um, I'm a husband of a patient. My name's Bob. Uh, when my wife uh, first uh, got it, um, it took a number of weeks and a number of different um, visits to various medical organizations before we hit upon uh, you, Dr. Yuzoni, to be honest, and she was part of that 30-person study that you showed. Um, and I'm wondering how to push the information down so that people are looking at it more quickly um, rather than uh, treating it as a uh, series of headaches or something along those lines. And then secondly, is there any information about uh, how long between the time a person first has symptoms to the point where they really need to get on a program of prednisone and Actemera or whatever? Thanks. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's very important. We, we always, I'm obviously, the patients are the most important thing for us, but we acknowledge that being a relative, right, uh, and, and taking care of, or accompanying uh, your, your, your next of kin is, is, it can be a big toll on, on itself, right? Anxiety, uncertainty. So we are working on increasing awareness. The Vasculitis Foundation is, getting, is doing a great job. There's many excellent investigators in, in pretty much every country. We're getting together in meetings every year, several times a year, actually. And we're always thinking about how we can continue to disseminate information, not only in English, in Spanish, Portuguese. There's a lot of interest from, from, from investigators and, and slowly we are getting there. Now with technology and Twitter and, and, and Facebook and everything, we are disseminating information, but we need to get better, but we, we are on our way. Um, these meetings I think are very important and they're being replicated in other cities and hopefully in other countries at some point. Uh, how soon a patient needs to be seen as soon as possible, and it depends on the disease. In, in GCA, it's very important that within, within days or, or weeks, right? There, the, we mentioned that there's a risk of vision loss. 95% of that vision loss will happen before the official diagnosis is made and prednisone is started. So there's a, there's a golden opportunity there to prevent blindness. Uh, so as soon as possible. Um, ankavasculitis is also a disease that can potentially inflame the kidneys, right? You need to act quickly. Some others like PMR is very uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. So we may have more time, uh, but it's as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.